Welcome everybody. I'd like to welcome you to this second edition of the Infosys Prize Winner Symposium. Thank you for joining us here on a weekday. Uh, the symposium is intended as a forum for discussing the work of the Infosys Prize laureates and to spark conversations around their work. This is also an arena to share ideas, discuss and hopefully inspire conversations and early career researchers. We hope that the conversation this evening will impress upon the audience why research, particularly collaborative and interdisciplinary research, is important and why it matters. Moderating the discussion between the winners of the Infosys Prize 2022 is Janvi Falke. Dr. Janvi Falke is the director of Science Gallery Bangalore and a science historian herself. And over to you, Janvi. Thank you. So I think the Infosys Science Foundation did an interesting thing in instituting these awards um, several years earlier. It's interesting, particularly in the, in the Indian context, because uh, they took on board the disciplines across the human, social, and natural sciences, which doesn't come very easily and naturally to, you know, to our higher institutions of higher education, but also the way we conduct research in this country. Having already done that for several years, um, the idea of the symposium has also been now encouraged. This is the second that's happening. And it's an opportunity for an interesting conversation between laureates of this year across disciplines to converge our thoughts on what it is to do research, why research might even matter, and what we might gain from talking to each other, but also to listening to each other. So with us today are in no particular order, from engineering and computer science, Professor Suman Chakrabarti from Hello. the Indian Institute of Technology, Khadakpur. Hello. Professor Sudhir Krishnaswamy from the National Law School. Professor Vidita Vaidya from the Tata Everyone. Institute of Fundamental Everyone. Research. Professor Mahesh Kakre from the Indian Institute of Science. Professor Nisim Karnekar from the National Center for Radio Astrophysics. And Professor Rohini Pandey from Yale University. So welcome everyone, welcome to the laureates, and we can begin this evening. Um, I'm going to ask them a set of questions, four altogether to begin with, after which we have a few more questions, but at that point we will start inviting um, questions from the audience. So if you have questions that come up in your mind, hold on to them until we finish just the first four, and then bring them on. So, starting uh, with you, Mahesh, um, the first round goes in alphabetical order. After that, we can mix it up. Um, why do you do what you do? So, I, I'm a mathematician. I work in an area of mathematics called number theory. So, this is uh, solving equations for integer solutions. And the reason why I do what I do is, uh, I think it's a great thing to be able to uh, do what you are good at and also enjoy doing it. So this is, the, this is my simple reason for doing uh, what I do. Uh, ever since I um, studied number theory in high school, I, th that's what I wanted to do. And uh, um, I've been incredibly lucky to be able to do it. And uh, I, I think I'm good at it. So it's, it's a joy to do something that I'm good at. Uh, Wonderful. Nisim. Uh, <clears throat> I guess I just love astronomy. I like the idea about learning about uh, the uh, about the universe, about large scale things that have no uh, immediate effect on us. But uh, and just knowing about how the universe evolves. So, from a reasonably early stage, I've been fascinated about uh, um, about about the originally stars, but uh, especially galaxies now and cosmology and the evolution of the universe. And it keeps you awake at night, so it's fun. <laughs> So you are clearly, your, your, your circadian rhythm works um, in conjunction with your research? Pretty much, yeah. Okay. Rohini. Um, I'm an economist. I'm a development economist who works on issues in political economy. And 
I think it would be fair to say that for the longest time, I wasn't very sure what to do. So I tried many things that I was either not good at or I didn't enjoy. And I think in the end, what I enjoyed about what I work on is the combination of the set of questions that I wanted to know the answer to. Um, but there was also enough um, abstraction in defining the question that you felt you could make some progress on answering it. Um, I think the challenge when I started and that still remains is then how do you move back from that abstraction that you've imposed to convince yourself and others that you're saying something about the world we live in. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, over to you, Sudhir. Yeah, thanks, uh, Janvi. Uh, I mean, like, like the one, the speakers just before me, I guess we all would have some range of intrinsic and some extrinsic motivation. So most, most of us have already mentioned intrinsic reasons why we enjoy doing what we do. And if we didn't, then it would be rather painful to spend l many years doing it. Yep. But I, I suspect that in, in an area like law or political science, you very quickly alerted to the extrinsic consequences of what we do, you know, economics and development theory, I suppose, would line up. And so when we ask questions about why we uh, focus on the issues that we do, we, we are alert to what this means in the world and what it might, uh, the impacts it might have in the world. So. I, so I, sus I suspect I'll join the other laureates in saying the intrinsic reasons apart that, that at least in my field, you're very, very quick to, to think about how this works out, uh, even as you uh, ask, uh, force yourself to ask rigorous and interesting questions. Mm -hmm. So on. Yeah, I mean, uh, from the early uh, stage of my career, I really didn't have a clear idea, you know, for, you know, what is that in which I'm really good or I'm likely to be good. Mm. But I tried to eliminate in the areas which, in which I'm not so good. Mm. So I started, you know, eliminating you know, things, but there was a commonality. I always liked to be a good teacher. Mm. And I found that the best way of, you know, learning and starting to enjoy learning is by being a teacher because you mostly learn from, you know, others who are supposed to be, you know, not as educated as you, but you actually learn more from them. And uh, that is how I, you know, try to uh, direct my work, not in a very structured way, but in a direction which belongs to an area where I am perhaps better than, you know, in some other areas where I am not so good, and I enjoy doing that. And that is how, you know, the, my research work, which started from more like, understanding the fundamentals of fluid dynamics, how fluid flows in you know, small channels, to you know, starting uh, doing applied work like what you are saying, more extrinsic thing. So how to divert it more towards applications which can benefit common people, solve the healthcare challenges of the country and the society, and really you know, enjoyed this transition. Okay. So, um, as a kid growing up, I was probably, you know, we didn't have TV channels. We had one, Durdarshan, right? And once in a way, you had BBC programs on it, and you got to watch Jane Goodall if you were lucky, or you heard about Ryan Fossey. And you couldn't imagine that there were people who got paid to sit and interact with chimps or gorillas, and this could actually be a thing. I don't do anything remotely like that, but in a laboratory setting, I get to watch behavior. And as a neurobiologist, I guess amongst the biggest questions, period, is why do we behave the way we do, mm -hmm. right? So this is the fact that one gets to do this in a laboratory type of setting is something that I, I love doing. And, and I just want to continue doing what I enjoy and, and love, and that's why I do it. I do have a little bit of envy and desire to be that person who gets to actually sit in the wild and see it in the real world. But I sit in my more controlled conditions and get to do this. So I think it's just the opportunity to have fun uh, doing what one loves to do and to have the privilege to continue to do it across one's life. So, yeah. Wonderful. So, I mean, what we have um, across the table are motivations, as you said, both extrinsic and intrinsic. So the desire to actually um, try to find out what you're good at or know what you're good at and then pursue it, you know, even further um, and see what impact it can have um, along the way. Um, 
on the world around us. So we'll come back to some of those, uh, some of those questions again. Um, you know, to just tag, along, tag on a small question onto this, which is that does the motivation change in the career path? You know, I mean, in a way, you're also probably um, the youngest on this table. So I'm just wondering if the in extrinsic factors, in a way, become more important as you go along in your career, or is, th or, or, and, and what happens then to the intrinsic sort of motivations to pursue uh, questions that you, that you really love. So uh, if I may um, start with you, Vidita. So I think the big shift is initially you are the trainee, you are the apprentice, you are the one who's sitting in a space learning from people who are way ahead of you in that journey and you just feel really lucky to be around people who are asking interesting questions. And then somewhere along the line you're the partner, which is you're doing it with people who are perhaps your comrades or compatriots. And then somewhere along the line you realize, hey, you get the joy of sharing this with a much younger bunch of excited people too. Mm -hmm. And that I think is a shift that is really wonderful because there comes a point where you're like, this is something I thoroughly enjoy and maybe there's someone else who will enjoy this as much. So the opportunity to train and mentor and work with, that's I think a big shift. And that's actually quite contagious because it feeds off each other. Right, you get to share your joy, but then the joy that comes back at you is also very contagious, and it's a phenomenal energy that can happen in that mentorship equation. Mm -hmm. so. Nassim? So, I would strongly agree with, with Viditha, but one thing that I would add, which uh, um, certainly, I mean, this transition from, from being a trainee mm. and, uh, and making an ass of yourself, and, and you know, nobody, uh, being surprised because you know, you, you're young and you're, you, you, know, you, you make mistakes, to feeling slightly more responsible. I, I think it's important to, to be willing to make mistakes later in your, I mean, to, to keep that going. The thing that, the transitions that certainly have bothered me in the last, let's say, few years, uh, it's fun, it's great fun working with students, right? It's, it's, it's wonderful, it's, it's one, and, and you know, if you're working with good students, for example, uh, the, the people who have worked with at the GMRT in the last few years has been hugely exciting. And it uh, keeps you awake at night again. But uh, one thing that has bothered me is that I do sometimes think that I am not doing the work, mm -hmm. so to speak. <laughs> and so every so often I kind of look at myself and say, you know, what a useless person. You're just sitting around the place and you're talking to people and they do the work. And so I think... Uh, it's, I think it's nice to keep your, to, to keep your hands dirty and mm. uh, you know, actually spend time yourself doing stuff. And I think that has to be conscious. Uh, if, you, if you don't do that, you kind of move away from the... I mean, it's, you, you know, it's, when, you're a, when you're a student, it's a lot of fun to, even if it's a small thing, mm. that you know this. You're the first person who knows this. There's nobody, it, it could be completely trivial, but you're the only person who knows it. And when you're working with somebody else who tells you what the answer is, so to speak, part of that, it, it's great fun, of course, but you know, you're chatting about it, so it's always nice. Mm. But part of the fun of being the only person to know about it has gone away. <laughs> so I think it's important to actually sit and you know, fool around yourself. And I think fooling around is probably important, at least for me, um, later on. That one, it, doesn't, it, it leaves you not taking yourself that seriously. Mm. You kind of feel that you know, you're as silly as you were 25 years ago. And you might make similar mistakes, and those mistakes might actually cause you to grow. You learn from your mistakes, and if you, if you never make mistakes, and you know, if, if you get to a point where you're not making mistakes, you probably are not growing as much as you should. Hmm. So I kind of babble foolishly around that for a while, but yeah. Rohini. Um, I mean, I think a lot of what I was thinking about has been captured. I think the thing I worry about sometimes is that when these transitions are happening, if you don't realize they're happening, you can um, do a poor job of managing the power dynamics, right? So when you're a PhD student, you can grumble, you will not probably shout at your uh, mentor, but mm. even if you did, you would bear the cost of it. Mm. Of course. Uh, immediately, and so you will learn not to shout at it. <laughs> if you are the mentor, yeah. you can actually go a long way shouting and not bearing the cost of it. And there are so many 
people who often don't realize that they are now in that position where they can actually terrify someone by what they say and what they do. Mm. They think of themselves, I'm your equal, I'm sitting with you, I'm your equal, why can't I just speak what I want to say? So I think that's certainly been a learning process for me and is, is to say that it's not just realizing that now I'm teaching, but also that I have an ability to cause reactions in people that I would not like to have that power, but you know, I have to accept that I have it and kind of behave responsibly for that. Mm. So I think that has been, I think that's probably, I'd say, a transition that's difficult to manage because sometimes you have to bite your tongue or not fool around in ways that you would like to fool around for exactly that reason. Mm. Sudhir. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking what Nisim was saying. You, you said babbling around, but I, I, very useful to, to reflect that. I, I, if you lose that uh, sense of joy and um, yeah. playfulness about work, I think then, then that range of potentially useful work that you may even end up doing just goes away, right? But my, my, my sense is that I think being alert to the balance is important, even, even as a PhD student, because if you don't have a sense of where this work fits in the world, mm. um, and, and there's a lot of that kind of research here especially, that it, you can be totally idiosyncratic and, and, and be very special to yourself and maybe a supervisor mm. and a, a small department somewhere. And the work is not really engaging the field in any meaningful way. And I think that being alert to that extrinsic sense of where does this even go and what, what, is, what is that contribution field is, is important. And I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't take the idea that that somehow is important at an early stage and then at a later stage we can forsake one for the other or, or something like that. I take the, the point about responsibility though and, and I think the, the idea that we have these very, what, uh, difficult intergenerational expectations of what is <clears throat> what it means to be a peer, and I mean an academic peer, and then a supervisor is, is yeah, quite complicated in our time. So I, I, I take that, but I think as as an individual researcher, we don't have a choice but to keep both ends going. If mm -hmm. if we didn't, then we might end up someplace else. Yeah. Suman. Yeah, uh, to me, it, uh, you know, the transition that we all go through, you know, if we are very honest to us, the first level is, you know, making our own career. Yeah. And perhaps the next level is, you know, making it for others. Mm. Yeah. And uh, this transition is something that, you know, we do not perhaps very consciously go through. But uh, all of us, when we started our journey as a researcher, I mean, uh, we were a bit, you know, uh, limited, I would say, in terms of our, you know, first question perhaps that we, we would have asked us that how it will make my career. Maybe we have not very explicitly written it down somewhere. But there has been a stage, I think, in all of us who are sitting here and beyond, a stage has come that we find that, well, you know, something we have made in our career, maybe incrementally it would have gone in, in a direction, but what broader it can be done mm. to impact others and to impact for a broader cause. And that realization is, I think, a different level of transition as we mm. go through our journey as a, you know, from a research student to maybe a advisor and you know, senior person. Mm. Mahesh. Well, um, my motivations haven't changed sort of in what I do, but um, you know, sometimes you kind of hit a wall in your research and then you have to do something else. And my worry about you know being a mentor to my students and so on always is, uh, I I think about problems which I enjoy and often they turn out to be very difficult and I'm I'm worried that sometimes I may give very difficult questions to my students so I have to be mindful of that. You know, it's happened a lot that I, I think about something for a year or two and I just hit a wall and you know then I have to think about something else which is maybe not en as enjoyable but you can always go back to. Mm. What you are doing, uh, what you were thinking about earlier, uh, hopefully, is, you know, you 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 get an idea somewhere along the way when you are thinking of something else. Uh, yeah. So, but my motivations haven't changed for what, what yeah. I do. Also, uh, you know, the nature of research in each of your disciplines is so different. I mean, for you, it would be way more collaborative um, labs, Absolutely. whereas for you, I'm I'm imagining, but please 
jump in and say that it would be not collaborative to the extent that Vidita's work would be, for example, right? Like you, you have a lab with... No. Uh, yeah. So, um, and similarly for you, large a large collaboration, you'd work with teams uh, maybe, or please no, go I, ahead, I, tell I, us. I, um, I actually, so astronomy has moved in the direction of large teams. Yeah. I have a physical dislike for large teams. Mm. But the, the reason I like astronomy is that there's room for all kinds of people. Yeah. There's room for people, you know, who are doing stuff by themselves. There's room for people who are doing stuff, you know, with a few people. Yep. And there's also room for folks who are working in teams of, you know, 100. I would be scared witless of working in teams of 100. I mean, it's just not my style. But the good thing with astronomy, I think, is that there's room for, you know, all kinds of people. And so I, I tend to work in small groups of, you know, a, a few people mm -hmm. at most. And, uh, yeah. So probably not very different from Vidita in Yeah, I would sense. imagine. I mean, I, yeah. it's certainly not on the scale of things like the Large Hadron Collider and those yeah. teams. I mean, that's, yeah. that gives you a sense of what scale of collaborations can be, right? Those are global collaborations. I mean, these are still teams of 20 people, perhaps labs of 20 or 30 collaborating with each other. So it's still within a manageable size where you know individual people. I don't, sometimes I look at the publications that come out from where, where there are 1,000 people, I'm wondering, do those people, act, have they ever ac actually met or spoken to each other? But they are still, you require that scale too if you're taking on large problems of that size. And I think, I think it's nice to have the whole spectrum from individual all the way to very large teams. So what I'm going to do now is, uh, you know, we have here uh, listening to us colleagues of all of you and all of us, I imagine, um, who come from your disciplines. So it would be great if each of you explained what you do in a couple of sentences and also probably say a little bit about, you know, uh, to what extent is your work collaborative, what kind of people does it involve um, uh, across disciplines or not. Uh, maybe even mention a little bit about the size of the group that you work with. So, in a, so just to get a sort of slightly more empirical sense of what it is, you know, that your, that your research is and how you do it. So uh, if we just sort of go round in this manner, so Nisim? So I'm an observational radio astronomer. I'm an, uh, well, a radio astronomer. Uh, I, I, do, uh, I, I, I would describe, I, I would use the adjective radio, but I, I do stuff in other branches of astronomy as well. And in astronomy, we, so I, I mainly work on galaxy evolution and also on trying to test for changes in the fundamental constants of physics using astronomical observations, again, of galaxies. So I would call myself a galaxy evolution person. And uh, in astronomy, we tend, the, the, the way you function is that if you're an, observ an, an observer, you tend to write proposals to telescopes, which, and you have deadlines which come once or twice a year. And uh, you put in proposals, you're evaluated, and you get observing time, or in some cases, you don't get observing time. And if you don't get observing time, you complain like mad. If you get observing time, you sit around and analyze the data a few months later. And usually, those, the proposals are put in in collaboration with people, in, and Again, with the numbers ranging from few to many, my groups tend to be ranging from one, me, uh, to maybe about half a dozen. Okay. So yeah, so I'm uh, from mechanical engineering, uh, which is one of the core branches of engineering, and in particular, uh, working with fluids, like how fluid flows in, in, in various contexts. Now, uh, if you think of my research, which is now, you know, a sort of, you can say, a balance between, you know, deep fundamentals on, on the subject and also applications in healthcare. That means doing work to bring out technologies for the benefit of common people, diagnostic technologies. Now, if you see the, you know, the extent of collaboration required, yeah, of course, it, it is not as, you know, maybe 1,000 people in a paper, you know, not like that. But, uh, you know, it, it can vary from, say, one to maybe up to ten. So one is very individualistic. For example, I still, you know, like to work on problems which I think that, you know, is perhaps too tough for my students to, you know, work on and synthesize, do something on myself and maybe work out a solution out of that. So it may be one. But commonly, you know, for the works that I do, that is use... Uh, fluid flow for making medical diagnostic devices, I require at least some people from, you know, core engineering discipline mm. and some people from medical and allied applications, healthcare or life sciences. So in that way, you know, it doesn't uh, mean really how many in number we require, mm. but at least one from each. 
And uh, you know, the, the whole idea is that many times it is, it is a very black box kind of approach that we follow. That means I have never been trained in medicine and some terms are very, very complex to me. Yeah. But there is, if there is somebody who simplifies it to an extent and tells me what is expected out of me, yeah. you know, then I can deliver that. And then for that person, maybe you know, the equations that I use for solving fluid dynamics is you know, that I have to abstract. So in that way, you know, um, you know, the size of the team depends really on uh, how many you want to really you know, form the core to work on the problem. And many times uh, you also have you know, people working in the field, so they are also parts of team. You may not see them uh, as authors of a paper. But you know, to me, a very brilliant student is equally important as a phlebotomist who you know, pricks the finger and takes a drop of blood mm. and does the test. So in that way, we have a variety of people. And uh, of course, the work can vary from very individualistic to a teamwork like this. So I'm an economist. And I guess when we teach Economics 101, we always start by saying, you know, economics exists because there's a scarcity of resources. And you have to decide where to allocate them and how to make trade-offs. And there's. When we, again, when we taught the first class, it's taught in a, almost a very um, atomistic way of saying there must be a right way of doing it, and if we can figure out how to do it, that's where it'll go, and we talk in terms of efficiency. Um, but then if we look at what's happening around the world, if we look at what's happening where we live in India, it's clear that what matters very often is things like norms or customs and how people allocate resources. Power relationships matter a lot. So I'm very interested in trying to ask questions about how um, both formal and informal institutions and uh, issues of, say, power play out in uh, understanding how resources are allocated, where does it lead to distortions, why does it lead to growth processes to leave some people behind, why does it even in issues of, say, climate change policy mean that we have a lot of people who are upset about air pollution but nothing gets done about it. So those are the kind of issues I think about. And in trying to provide answers, um, it means coming up with a hypothesis of what the reason is, thinking about how to define a counterfactual to test it against, and then typically implementing it in the field. So my partners will range from either government partners or NGOs who we work with to think about what the right question to answer is. Um, it's the large teams of people who help implement them, some of whom are here in the room. Um, and then to, um, I think the largest participants is obviously the citizens. They're the ones whose behavior we're trying to understand. So we survey them, we ask them to do things like give us, um, say, measurements of their stress levels. And they actually don't tend to feature as authors as people, but probably are the largest population we owe our research to. Mm -hmm. But it, over time, I think as, as I think this kind of field work expand, but also I think as computing power has expanded, it's become more possible to use large administrative data sets, but also to collaborate across fields. I'd say at least applied economics has definitely moved a lot more in the direction of being more like a team setting or a lab setting, even though we would have in economics, say, theorists who would work alone. Yeah. So I'm a neurobiologist who's interested in neurocircuits that regulate behavior, in particular emotional behavior. And we use rats and mice as our model system. And it is a collaborative laboratory atmosphere in which we work because it's always, it's team science. Mm. You know, most of the experiments involve multiple people interacting to actually execute the experiment. Um, I'm not at the bench as much as I'd like to be and I miss it because I think I've, my hands are rusty on certain things. I can still do certain things pretty well, but there are plenty where I will be, you know, mm. I'll be a handicap to the team and it should be put aside and certainly <laughs> not an advantage. So, uh, you know, I, I take the Sims point that keep the, keep the tools, uh, you know, sharp. But uh, it is a team effort, and it's kind of vital. It is because there's a lot of inbuilt failure into some of these experiments. Yes. By definition, you may start with a hypothesis. More often than not, you discover something which is utterly unrelated to the hypothesis that you started off with. And mm -hmm. more often than not, it tends to be that way, actually. And so I think the team helps buffer that ability to t tackle that failure. And it's always interesting to see when you have multiple people working together, and someone else or the other is having a high moment of aha, and someone else is perhaps not have, having a failed experiment. And you can always celebrate each other's successes of experiments when you're working like that in a team. Uh, we also tend to collaborate 
quite extensively, partly because I think the way neuroscience is today, it needs multiple different forms of expertise. Hmm. And we really benefit from you know, electrophysiologists who are dealing now with large scale data sets, which would be really hard for us to even put our, you know, wrap our head around, and that computing power will become even more and more relevant, especially with things like neuropixel recordings, recording millions of neurons simultaneously. It becomes tricky to actually break that data down. So collaborations at that end, and then the collaborations at the end where we want novel chemical entities and novel molecules to work with. So the chemists become, so it's quite a wide spectrum, and in that sense, it is a melting pot. And neuroscience has always attracted people with very different original expertise, perhaps, hmm. and so people coming together to solve interesting hmm. problems. Sudhir. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm a lawyer, and but interested in the intersections between law and politics, and I've come at the question in two different ways, and atypically, I think, in, in some ways. Um, I mean, we could take a very thin doctrinal view of law and study cases and statutes and constitutions and tell interesting and important stories and that that's in some ways the traditional mode of doing um, legal research and um, legal work and dare I say a bulk of legal research still resembles that mode but um, I've tried to to extend that in 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 some in some at least interesting ways to me. And the first is to do it more humanistically, looking at philosophy, mainly yep. political philosophy, and to address your question, which is that is mostly seen as solo work, yes. and it is. And so much of that is just reading and trying to work through long volumes written over many centuries and trying to have a fresh take on it or at least a, a, a new variant of it. But I find that, uh, just as Suman said, teaching makes a huge difference because I think that text can be uh, come alive in a way in a classroom, especially philosophical work, that, that as much as you sit at a desk um, may not happen. And th there's a way in which you fire in different ways in the classroom. Just those conversations make a huge difference. So though m much of that work is solo in a sense, even in authorship senses, you learn a lot through this kind of more um, social engagement. But the other part that I do is more empirical, and I've turned to that um, uh, at least in sequence after doing the more political theory philosophy work. And, and that work is much more team-based in the way that Rohini described mm -hmm. uh, for, much, for many of the same reasons, which first that you don't know all the tools and all the methods that you need to know, and Second, that uh, empirical work needs many hands. Um, mm. And so if you're doing large surveys, uh, there are all those surveyors who never make, it to the na make their names to the paper, who are you know, thousands of surveyors who are generating the, the data that we're relying on. So that's large teamwork. Mm. And I mean, just going back to your earlier question, I, I think you're right in that as you start designing some of this work, then you, you, you spend a lot of time managing and designing this work rather than just doing it yourself. Uh, the number of times you make it into the field uh, survey context gets limited, and we get, we, we get less of what tactile in the, in the way we understand that field. And that's some of the hazards of, of size and scale in, in doing this kind of work. So as I mentioned earlier, I'm a number theorist. More specifically, I do algebraic number theory uh, and Iwasawa theory, which um, so to solve equations, you kind of attach various objects to it. And uh, so some of those objects are analytic in nature, some are arithmetic in nature. And, uh, and then there are kind of precise conjectural statements which relate the two. And those are the sort of uh, things I, uh, I try to prove. Um, my, my collaborations have been uh, sort of very traditional, you know, talking to a couple of people and then making some progress. But mathematicians are trying some interesting experiments, uh, such as uh, polymath program, which you may have heard about. So you know, um, somebody pose, posts a question on a forum, and then a bunch of people who have some ideas about it get together on, on that forum and mm -hmm. try to make some progress. And I think it's a very interesting experiment of uh, how to 
uh, how collaboration in mathematics can evolve and become large scale. It, it hasn't yet, I think, um, uh, given any spectacular breakthrough, but uh, there's no reason why this can't change. Uh, you know, it can't evolve into something which will um, solve very big and central problems. There's something intermediate where people kind of come together um, uh, for a few weeks uh, at a workshop and really in intensely kind of think about a particular thing because which they had been thinking about individually separately uh, and uh, yeah this is again something that has maybe has better has had better success than polymath but um, uh, yeah and uh, these these things are evolving I think so one of my collaboration has been uh, of of this nature where I wrote a paper with seven people and we have we are continuing to work together and, you know with with zoom and so on it's much easier these days to have such collaborations on a larger scale in maths as well oh yeah okay that's interesting to know and I think also the examples in a way you know open our mind to how because again like um, political philosophy something, you know, uh, I spent some years in my youth trying to grapple with, um, you know, math is usually thought of as a solo exercise in a sense, right? Like you sit, I mean, you know, the figures that come to your mind are Ramanujan and, you know, <laughs> among others, et cetera. So I'm going to um, ask in no particular order, so feel free to come in or I can also ask is that, you know, what is the role of serendipity and chance in your research outcomes? And can you sort of, you know, uh, Maybe there's a story you want to tell or not, uh, but share with us. I mean, for me, it's huge. I think that's true for many wet lab biologists. Mm. You know, it's uh, a lot of times it's about something that happens and you happen to notice it rather than you went looking for it, yeah. right? So very often it tends to be that when we tend to talk about it, we describe it sometimes like we had the idea in the very beginning and we went looking for it. It's interesting how papers and manuscripts get written because when they get written, they get, it, there's a clear hypothesis that you had, then you went looking, then you found it, then you, you know, but more often than not, that's just the way the story is presented. What happened in reality is that you were looking for something else, something else happened, then you realize this was way more exciting than what you were actually originally thinking about. Then you change your entire direction. And so this was pretty much what happened to us when we stumbled on the finding that serotonin regulates mitochondria. We were looking at something completely different. We were actually looking at neuroprotective substances in plant-derived moieties and not finding any neuroprotective mm -hmm. stuff. And then we began hunting for a positive control. And our positive control was a growth factor, which worked really well as expected. And because our lab likes to work with serotonin, given we look at mood-related behaviors and effects, we decided to just dump serotonin on, as just, just like that, to look at what happens to neuroprotection, which we expected, uh, you know, based on literature, it would, but certainly didn't expect the scale of effects on mitochondria. And mm -hmm. initially, there was, there was disbelief, because it was a little hard to imagine that what we had done as just a fun little dribbling on in a couple of wells was actually the main, most interesting thing. We dumped everything else we were chasing and changed direction entirely to focus on this. So I, I often discuss this with my students, which is when we wrote the paper, yeah. it sounded like we actually were looking for this. What, it, what the reality is that we found this and then we discovered, oh wow, we should have been looking but we had no clue yeah. that this actually happens, right? So there is a huge role for serendipity. And I think I missed the, one of the things, one of the courses I took very early on was a history of neuroscience course. Mm. And I love the old books because there was yeah. brave ability to speculate with no requirement of having data to support it. Yeah. Which means you could make statements with great freedom with possibility of getting it utterly wrong, but at least you could speculate on that scale. And now, because you must have data to back up everything, there should be a speculative section left for every yeah. manuscript to allow you to be free to you know, just um, shoot the breeze. Many of those ideas will be utterly wrong, but every now and then, you stumble on something. So yeah, this was complete serendipity. I mean, there's a story that I, that I can come in here with, you know, as a historian of science, um, there's a, there's a, there are two programs across the world, one, at, one in Caltech and one in Oldenburg in Germany, where they replicate old historical experiments with fidelity. 
right? So effectively, you replicate Hertz's experiments without the knowledge, uh, oh, sorry, uh, with the assumption that he wasn't looking for electromagnetic waves, right? And so what does that mean? And what do you learn when you do it with fidelity, right? Like with the copper wires, with not, not using any of the new stuff, and what then, what do you learn out of that, right? Like the, the failures, but also the, 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 the embodied knowledge or the tacit knowledge that you gain through actually working with that material, I mean, it, it, it makes also for very interesting history, right? And as you, I mean, you know, you, you brought up the history of neurosciences with it, that speculation in a way, you know, uh, allows for the imagination to, to take research in directions hitherto unimagined, right? And like I said, you know, you could get it completely wrong, but then, you know, that's what, in a way, coming back to, you know, the, the motivations for, you know, the, are, are you in it to get it right? Are you in it to get interesting? Are you, you know, what, what is it? So um, serendipity and chance, I mean, you know. So, yeah. so it's interesting because I think, um, in certainly in development economics, I think there has been a move to try to prevent serendipity in some ways. So, you know, there's a lot more interest, for instance, in having pre-analysis plans that you must specify your hypothesis, you must register it. And, uh, you know, maybe you can have a section where you say you do some speculative work, but, you know, referees will ask you to say, tell us what deviations you had from your pre-analysis yeah. plan. Yeah. And I think some of it, and I think people have uh, taken views on both sides of this, is this thought of how much is economics actually in the social science a science. Yeah. If you think it's a science, then all of this becomes more important. Replication becomes very important. Uh, it becomes very important to be able to sort of have hypotheses that you can test and disprove or prove. While if it's um, more of a social science or something where context matters a lot, then maybe you, know, you, you can't expect replication or you might say that what you learn is actually going to be the most important thing because you can't predict ex ante in a particular context what matters. And I think that probably should be a much more live debate than it is. I think in economics, we, the mainstream very often tends to become quite technocratic and dry. But I think it would be nice for perhaps economists to hear from scientists saying that we think serendipity has a role to play because it's sort of economists trying to be scientists where they're pushing back against all of that. Um, I mean, just to give you an example from my work, I think the one place time where scientific matter was interesting. I do a lot of field experiments, but it wasn't a field experiment study where I think I would have been much more constrained. I was actually in an interdisciplinary um, conference where the uh, public health people where they started talking about this sort of South Asia enigma that why are Indian children shorter than African children, even though India is richer than many sub-Saharan African countries. And it was literally a case of kind of being intrigued by the question, and at that time, I guess I still played more than I did now with data, and it's just, as you said, just putting in controls and putting in things and sort of seeing this fact that actually a first-born Indian child is as tall as a first-born African child, but there's a huge birth order effect. So a third-born Indian child is, some, is like, I think something like a, one standard deviation more likely to be stunted and shorter. Mm. And now, so first the fact was, was by serendipity in some sense, we just put in some controls. But then where, how do you even start thinking about how to explain this mm. fact and where do you go, which is, you know, then, you know, uh, you know I guess. Uh, so it's, it's, a very, it's a very different way of looking, I think, for answers if you're not going to be very tightly controlled by hypotheses and tests. Well, and just to end the story so that you're, I'm sure <laughs> you're not hanging on the edge of your seat, but in case you are, I think our theory <laughs> was it in the end had a lot to do with sun preference. And ah. so we know that girls come to come from larger families because you have boys till you have a son, but those larger families also tend to run out of resources and therefore the second and third born children are going to be shorter because mm. you're having, you have daughters, but you want to have a son, so you know you're going to have to have more children and start cutting back, so. Mm. So I guess maybe I can go. I think serendipity has it's, it's foundational, certainly, in astronomy, but I think it's got two things. One is that it affects your choices. Mm. Uh, the interactions that you have at different stages of your career can drive you in directions which are often entirely serendipitous. I mean, it depends, for, exa for example, you know, at, at the trivial case, in my case, when I, uh, in my master's, as you know, most students in India are, I was fascinated by theoretical physics. Mm. And I desperately wanted to do quantum mechanics and black holes and all the usual nonsense that, you know, kids want to do. <laughs> and uh, I was just lucky to be at Pune University at the time. And uh, uh, on the campus at which the National Center for Radio Astrophysics had been set up a few years before. Mm. And I was much more interested in theoretical astronomy, not in observational astronomy. 
But uh, it turned out, just by sheer chance, I got admission into NCRA, and NCRA was building the GMRT, the, the mm -hmm. telescope, the giant meter wave radio telescope at the time, so just coming online. And the first time I went to see the telescope, I went with uh, Pramesh Rao, who was, in fact, there were two of us theorists who went down. One was much worse than me, he was a mathematician, apologies, Mahesh. <laughs> <laughs> The two of us went down and uh, with Pramesh, and we just fell madly in love with the telescope. It just it's a beautiful it, piece. It just blew us away. Yeah. And uh, so it was, you know, you really felt like working with it, mm. and that caused a transition. And so, if I had not joined NCRD and not been to the GMRT, mm. I probably would not have become a radio astronomer. So you know, it, these small perturbations in your trajectory can have huge implications. The second thing, of course, in astronomy is hugely serendipitous. I mean, Baconian experiments are foundational in astronomy. You just go and look. There's stuff out there that you have no idea about. In fact, you know, something that has been mentioned uh, in astronomy is that if you want to detect something interesting, you should build a telescope to, do, uh, to work in the area in which I work, just 21 centimeter emission, where you look for gas in galaxies. So you build a telescope to do these surveys. You won't find anything at all in that field you find a whole bunch of fun stuff in other fields. <laughs> and so it's, it's just that there's stuff out there. So in astronomy, I mean, even more, I think, than other fields, serendipity plays a huge role. I mean, there have been so many results over the last you know, 50, 60 years. I mean, th the start of radio astronomy is because Carl Jansky was looking for, was trying to do transatlantic uh, communication. Hmm. And he just built antennas to look for, you know, to, to, to try measure the quality of communications and suddenly found, oh my gosh, I've got signals coming from the sky. What the heck is that? Yeah. So we have a history of, you know, of serendipity, so to speak. Yep. Fabulous. Did, yeah, I mean, in, in my research outcomes, it's mostly been sort of meeting people by accident at uh, workshops and conferences and, uh, you know, just um, seminars and talking to them. This is why I kind of was uh, very disappointed that we were not traveling for the past uh, two, three years. Uh, you don't, uh, I mean, even if you log in onto Zoom 10 minutes before your talk, you don't sort of randomly ask people, oh, so what are you thinking about yes. these days? Whereas <laughs> at coffee, you, this is typically what you, what you ask people, you know, what are you thinking about these days or what, what are, whatever. Tell them what you are thinking about, you know, even if it kind of, uh, at a coffee table, it can, even if you make some, some, some comment which seems outlandish, nobody minds it, whereas, you know, yeah. the online thing, it's... So, uh, most accidents, you know, in, the, in my research um, have been about talking to people, telling them that, oh, I, I'm stuck here, I can't describe this, uh, this particular group or this particular algebra, and then they say, oh, there's some paper, like, from 25 years ago, which uh, has a, a different construction of this, and then you go and look, and that's precisely the thing that you want, and uh, so that's... Uh, that's very useful, um, uh, yeah. yeah. So I, I'll push in the direction that Rohini did, which is to push against the sort of over-professionalization of mm. research, which in the social sciences, humanities, it's, it's like you can try and find a very narrow question and then yeah. read just what you need to get a paper out or a few papers out. And the, the serendipity that, that I think is possible and happens, and I look at my own work on the work of others, but let's take one big example in legal theory, so Wittgenstein and yep. games and rules changed legal theory you know, in the 50s and 60s, and to think, and he, he didn't really write about yeah. legal systems or, or, or legal norms, hmm. but that model changed the way legal theory was done, and so there, there's a, I, th I think there's great value in moving between disciplines and moving between at least sub-disciplines, linguistic philosophy, legal philosophy. Mm -hmm. And that's very productive. It's, it's not always clear that it's productive in advance. And, and yes. so then the, there can just be a plea for breadth and, um, and you know, engagement. Maybe, maybe the, the sciences um, get more sharply defined questions, but certainly the humanities and the social sciences, this kind of... Uh, uh, openness is is critical. I think, I especially if you want to write something that's at least novel in the mm. in the modest scale. Mm. Then you've got to um, bring more breadth to the table. It's not there's no uh, the element of discovery is is I think a little um, less limited. So you're looking at, um, at 
human uh, societies in, in different ways, and it's the ways that in which you look that might make all the difference. And so that's, that's the way I would look at um, mm. chance and serendipity um, in, in my field. It's the, the breadth that is the key. Yeah, I mean, uh, the area in which I work, I have uh, seen that more or less the works which are very interesting and different are always emerging, you know, out of this accidental or chance factors. Yeah. And to me, the, the reason is very simple. So if I can make an hypothesis, which at the end I show is correct, yeah. then that means I know the answer before solving the problem, right? Exactly. And, and in, in most cases, I have realized that you know, if, you know, there are many answers like that, but that is not where the real fun of working with, you know, something very exciting is there. Uh, I can tell you one specific example which, you know, I myself encountered. Uh, in, in my career in working with, you know, fluid mechanics, uh, in, uh, in our traditional understanding, we, in engineering, study water through pipes, large systems, and, you know, so water is flowing. Very common, Who has a, whoever has done you know, elementary fluid dynamics will do that. Now, when I came to work with very small channels, mm -hmm. micro channels, nano channels and all, uh, I tried to see that, uh, you know, are these behaving in the same way as they are, they are doing for large pipes? Now, what uh, we found at some point of time is something very, very non-intuitive. Mm -hmm. That if you are making the channel rough, the water is facing less friction and it is moving faster. <coughs> and to an extent it went that me and you know, one undergraduate student was at that time you know, working with me on this. We started believing that the full experiments are wrong. And you know, then uh, somehow uh, you know, I could sort of uh, I mean, go around that and figured out that you know, we came up with a situation which is an entirely unknown phase transition that takes place so that if you have a rough wall and if you have a liquid, you know, under certain conditions you are having a very thin bubble layer that is acting like a cushion and it is not allowing the liquid to be, you know, uh, having the friction with the rough wall. So, you know, that was it. I never planned that, you know, that is the theory that I wanted to either, you know, prove or uh, you know, establish, mm. but it, 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 it came on like that and I always tell uh, even, you know, to my students that, see, uh, we are all born with certain intuitions, like even if you go to a, you know, newborn, uh, that person will not put finger in fire, you know, it is not taught in a class, but this is our intuition. So in most of the cases in science, uh, perhaps that intuition is justified and we learn why that intuition works but there are cases when the intuition doesn't work. And that is more or less by chance we come, up, come across and that's the fun of doing science. Mm -hmm. So I think we've kind of alluded to tacit knowledge, embodied knowledge, um, intuition, you know, which is um, I think as important to discuss as sort of, you know, the, the rigors of what we are constantly taught as method and system and structure, you know, all of which of course do come into play as well. You know, I'm going to ask you about, I'm going to ask you to sort of tell us what a day in your research life looks like. And I'll tell you why I'm asking this question. Again, it has come up in, you know, bits and parts uh, earlier, which is that just across this table, we are managing labs, teaching, mentoring, building institutions, maintaining institutions, um, a range of activities. How comfortably or uncomfortably does research nest within this sort of plethora of responsibilities. What does it gain from this? And again, you know, you've kind of alluded to it, but what does it also sometimes lose from, you know, having to take on um, a range of responsibilities? So, do you want to? Sure, yeah, I mean, uh, my typical day is by going into office at nine and then you know, doing a bunch of administrative things, uh, answering <laughs> emails, looking at, you know, all the overdue reports for uh, papers <laughs> to referee and so on and so forth, and ditto, um, ditto, ditto. meeting students, etc. Uh, you know, and, and then once I kind of finish all this, I try to, uh, it's, it's usually the task of writing something, you know, then that comes, like, it's kind of 
more mundane part of, of the research. You, know, you figure something out, but then you have to sit down and write it. Um, yeah, but uh, when I'm seriously thinking about something, all this goes for a toss, and you know that, that's how you you get a lot of overdue reports, and uh, <laughs> uh, you, know, you don't write uh, as much uh, about grant proposals as you would like to, and, and mm -hmm. so on. So, yeah. Uh, so w when I when I'm following a routine, it's usually when I'm not doing very interesting things. But if I'm thinking about something very interesting, I I have no routine as such. <laughs> So, I mean, you've got to ask us what, what the average day looks like and what the good day looks like. <laughs> <laughs> I so think I'm refining the question and taking on for I mean, because the average point. day uh, is loaded with all the institutional uh, um, elements that Mahesh has just mentioned and and with my role, more of them. Yeah. So, so um, you can spend an awful lot of time doing that. And th this is important work. Now, the... The, I mean, there are some of us who, who might, uh, you know, in a different mood would say that, hey, someone else should do this and I should be doing some more important work and so on. But it doesn't work like that. And I think especially in India, it doesn't work like that, if I might say, because I, my experience outside is that there are a lot of competent people running institutions extremely well and uh, the pressure to step up and do that is not, is not there. I mean, um, but in India, I think that equation is different. And, uh, um, uh, stepping up and playing those institutional roles is essential, I think. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, the other, thing, other good things that you might want to make happen will not happen. So that's the average day. The, um, I mean, there's one advantage, and I'll say that, which is that uh, if you're working in, in as, I, as I am in, in the area of law and looking at the way rules and institutions work, then you're getting some live, uh, live data all the time, and to the extent you can step back and look at what your the work you're doing analytically, you you learn a lot just by. And I work in, with public institutions most of the time, so I get to see this every day. So so that's useful. But uh, what's the good day? I'll still answer that question. I think that um, good, I I would rank a good day uh, to be much like Mahesh said, the ability to sequester yourself somewhere and not have to answer the phone or emails or pretty much anyone else. Really. I mean, so that would be a good day and the, the more productive day, um, in, at least in terms of writing and, and ideas. And um, the, more, the more of those days one can produce, the more productive one is, but uh, often chasing um, last week or last month, so in this case, last year's deadlines oh. is, is kind of where you are most of the time. Can I flip like an average day to a Friday? <laughs> because, um, so there isn't really an average day for an experimental lab, certainly not one in India sometimes, because there's a fair bit of trying to work out the mechanistic details of how you're going to get your antibody on time. Or, and every day is a different, different sort of a challenge. But we have a ring fence good days. Hmm. And so we ring fence our Friday. Mm -hmm. And our Fridays ring fence to start with lab meeting. Mm -hmm. And that's where everyone just comes in and there's usually food. Uh, there aren't visitants, but there's food. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's just a chance for everyone to get together and kind of reflect on the week that went. Yeah. Um, and like I said, I think some people are really celebrating. Some people have had a really rough week. And just because we're together, it buffers each other's week quite a bit. So I'd say Friday is inevitably a good day. Even if it's been a rough week the week before, it's also the weekend right around the corner. So we do end by saying, what are you going to do on the weekend to kind of, if you've had a particularly rough week, you kind of rejuvenate yourself to come back on Monday and get back on track. And so Fridays are usually good days. And we just re ring fence that morning to ensure it stays a good day. Uh, because it clear the administrative slate on that Friday morning so there isn't any you know paperwork to do. And we're just sitting together, shooting the breeze, talking science, talking about other stuff, and just collectively the whole team together. So those are usually good days. Sounds wonderful. <laughs> Sounds like a practice to take back to each of our workplaces. <laughs> so, I mean, I would just echo uh, uh, in that, you know, I think ring fencing days is very important. And I think, uh, you know, we, I ring fence Fridays as well, but that's sort of slightly more selfish reasons for doing my own work. I guess one place where I'm different from other people here is that, you know, most of my work is in India, but I don't live here. Yeah. 
So I guess one different kind of good day to talk about is actually when I actually managed to be in the field here because mm. you can spend a lot of time reading papers or going to seminars and sort of deciding you know how things work and then you turn up in a block office and um, try to think, figure out whether this latest digitization of Enriga master rules that you have read so much about is actually what's happening on the ground and you realize it's completely different. So, I mean, that's obviously in some levels a very bad day, but it's also a good day because you've learned something about actually what, what is happening in reality rather than what uh, you and others believe is happening. Yep. The, someone once gave me the idea of uh, um, forming important sounding committees in your head and then planting those meetings in your calendar <laughs> so nobody disturbs you and you find that time to actually do your writing for someone. Yeah, I mean, uh, to me, a good day is, you know, when I wake up and see there is no deadline to, you know, <laughs> uh, for that day, uh, usually tens or twenties uh, and uh, not hundreds of emails uh, which I have to answer some way or the other no way related to you know my research but you know having said that you know all of us are at at an age group where we have started to be in you know serving in different committees and all and i realize that you know all these are not really uncorrelatable uncorrelated in a very you know subject wise but i have seen that it has added some amount of wisdom maturity yeah. and sometimes by sitting in committees for example say committees of say, you know, project yeah. assessment, I have come up knowing certain areas which I have never, you know, used to otherwise, you know, think about. And sometimes that, you know, lateral idea which comes to my mind, it strikes me and very unconsciously I start applying that to my own research area. Yeah. So it doesn't go to a waste, and, but I, I wish that you know, I had got the time that I used to get in my early days of research yes. with the wisdom and maturity that I'm having now, that balance, <laughs> that is very rare. Uh, you know, as they say, when you have teeth, you don't quite have yeah, yeah. things you want yeah, yeah. Then At some point, you don't have your teeth and you've got everything that you need to eat. But, uh, so for me, um, I, I'm highly disorganized, so I tend to come in very late to the office, usually after lunch and sometimes at five o'clock. And I've been doing that since I was a PhD student, and for a reason, believe it or not, for a logical reason, which is that if you don't overlap with too many people, <laughs> you get a lot of work done. Yes. <laughs> so, and that is especially true now, I find, because now you tend to be on these committees and you have meetings, yep. and it really helps to come in late. You miss a lot of meetings. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. But, uh, so, so I tend to, an average day for me would be to come in you know, post-lunch or around lunchtime, and then spend a few hours doing things, like chatting with engineers at the telescope, uh, uh, doing uh, you know, for my sins, and I must have had many sins. I'm the dean of the institute, uh, and so that means that you have to do you know terrible amounts of. Si I, I've signed my name more often in the last six months than I've signed it in the last probably 48 years of my life. Mm -hmm. Very disconcerting. But the good news is that you know six o'clock is when all this stops, mm. and then from six in the evening, uh, after some a few cups of coffee, you can actually work through the night. Hmm. And that's a lot of fun. So, the, so then, you know, you have half your day, which is, you know, which drives you completely insane, yep. and the other half, which is great fun. So that's an average day. A good day for me, actually, is the exact opposite. So we have telescope proposal deadlines. And since I was a kid, I've always gotten excited by proposal deadlines, because somehow you tend to think very coherently <laughs> at those times. <laughs> I mean, I have a policy of procrastination in general, because following the philosophy that, you know, a meteorite might hit the Earth tomorrow. Yeah. So why bother about something which might, which might or might not happen three months from now? So I don't want to plan for a deadline three months from now. I prefer to think about it when I'm you know, two days before the deadline. Okay. So then there's very intense thinking, mm. and it's a lot of fun. You come up with wacky ideas in a, in a focused way. The best days for me are the ones we are hiking in the Himalayas, mm. because that's when you're completely away from the Institute, you're away from people. Yeah. You're also doing stuff which you really enjoy, and that's when you often find that your brain kind of is not switched on about the work that you're doing, but you often solve problems in the background. And you come back from eight days in the Himalaya, suddenly realizing, oh my gosh, I should try this thing out. Hmm. And you realize that you, I mean, you know, when you're kind of working in, in your field, right? There are times when things are not working. Yeah. And it can be hugely frustrating. 
And the fact that you're up in the Himalayas doing something that you like, or you know, at a wildlife sanctuary watching tigers doing stuff, and you're still thinking about astronomy, mm. that makes you realize that you, that you really love what you do. And so that's, that's a good day, because you come back feeling happy that, you know, that you come back rejuvenated, so to speak. Mm. So that's a good day. That's the best kind of days. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, so this is the last question before we um, take questions from the audience, and also we have a series of other questions that will follow. Um, so I'm, I'm going to borrow a phrase from you from an earlier conversation, Nisim, where you, know, you said one has to develop the feel for important questions. Right? So the question I'm going to ask you all is, what does it take to good, do good research? Right? So how do you identify good questions in research? And I ask this also because what is the value of strong disciplinary traditions to inform these questions? But also, what is to be gained or even lost, for that matter, in, uh, to, in having the conversations with, say, disciplines or practices um, that are considered, at least as a field, irrelevant to what you do? Right? So what does it take to pull it together? Like, and, you know, and, and, and how do you make the choices? So how do you develop that feel to tell yourself, yeah, oh, this is an exciting question to answer? Um, let me start with you. Well, uh, I mean, there are many structured ways of uh, you know, uh, looking for good questions for answer. And I have never found that you know, to be very useful. Like uh, you know, some of our colleagues say, read a good review article. Mm. So they will give you questions. Yeah. But I, I often find that those are very artificial questions. To write a good review article, you at the end say, you know, what is that work that remains people have to do? Yes. But what I have seen is that uh, a very interesting question comes spontaneously <clears throat> when you come across a situation where you do not know the answer and you do not also have a structured background of literature to support you know, that thing. Most of the times, the challenge is that we are not able to come up with very, very interesting research questions is we are overstructured about our research. Hmm. You know, we, we are many times teaching our students how to churn papers rather than ideas. Yeah. And so you know, they, they develop a sort of a feel of how to go about that. And in that way, uh, you, know, you, you really cannot make a structure, like, you know, uh, there are courses for innovation, mm. but you cannot make a you know, formula for innovation. I, I don't think it's possible. So to ask a research question, mm. there should not be a theory course which will tell you how to you know, ask a research question, because it is very different in, in, in different areas. But what I have found the most useful is you shed off the knowledge that you have on the subject, because your knowledge is the most constraining factor. It enforces you to ask questions related to what you already you know, have learned or your peers discuss with you. Mm. So in that way, sometimes I find that lack of knowledge mm. is you know, the best thing to pose good questions and knowledge is the best thing to answer the question. So if you have you know, this combination, I think, then you come up with a good research question. So the yeah, I, I'd follow Suman on this, that if, if, you, if you begin with uh, a disciplinary field and you know try and burrow your way to, to the narrowest question that you think you know having read some 20 odd papers or oh, this no one seems to have done mm. and I'm going to uh, go for that I, I find that the most kind of sterile and uninteresting kind of work those are the papers that don't move me when I read them and I I think on balance I stick my neck out and say those are the papers that don't travel very far either. I mean, they, they serve some purpose, they get published in reasonably good journals, uh, but I don't know what else they do. And so my intuition is that it's, it's useful to start with uh, more commonplace questions, questions that, that people are having everyday conversations about even, that uh, seem to be, that make you uncomfortable. You know? They seem to be common Mm -hmm. uh, conversations and, and when I say common, I don't mean that everyone on the street is talking about it. But you can see those questions in a they they they're spoken in a colloquial way, but they're manifestly there and 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 they don't seem to lend themselves to easy quest uh, to to easy answers or at least the answers are uncomfortable to you. 
and then to decompose them in disciplinary terms. I think that's, mm. that's the way I would, uh, you know, so I ask myself, what am I interested in? And, and then say, okay, in what kind of disciplinary uh, mold mm. addresses this question? What do I need to learn to address this question? Mm. And that is much more productive. It's a much harder way in some sense, so I don't know if that's what one will tell every mm. graduate student to do, but if, if you give yourself, back yourself to do it, I think that's, that's much more interesting work mm. uh, like that than to, to begin with that nice survey article and to, mm -hmm. and to you know, just parse the, the easily hackable question that's gonna get you through the gate. So that's my, my way of thinking about good questions. They, they, it usually means they have some salience in the world. Mm. Though the way you might write the paper, is an, I mean, we console ourselves that many people would read it. Mm. Um, but I, I take that, but at least the question might be interesting and important. Yeah. I'm going to come back to a phrase you used in an earlier conversation, which was about normative, not partisan, mm. right? And I, I'd love for you to say a little bit to that, following which we can also come to you, because, you know, that sort of line of thinking yeah. probably um, travels well uh, between your work and also Vidita's work to some extent, right? So if you were to just speak yeah, to sure. that a little and then... So yeah. there's, there's a fair bit of work in the social sciences and um, maybe even in, in the humanities that seems to um, line itself up around contemporary issues, but unfortunately along contemporary fault lines, you know, you pick some kind of partisan um, view of the question and then you feel that the answers must follow in along th those lines. And I, I just feel that that, is, that stifles um, people from doing interesting work and young scholars and graduate students and PhD scholars, if you get trapped there and there's a way in which it is fashionable, I think it, it works well in the world in some ways. And, mm -hmm. and if you get stuck then that that partisan furrow can dig very deep, you know, you can spend a lifetime uh, uh, flying a flag of this or that type and maybe the flags will change, but yep. you, you, the, the practice remains the same. And my sense here is that academic, good academic work will, will resist that. And uh, in, in our scholarship, we should both encourage and train scholars to, to not uh, fall into that it's it's an easy give and in some sense it you may even get success in some in some sense by 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 structuring your work in that way so in in the social science and humanities that's a very visible yeah. um, uh, trap and one that at least to my mind uh, must be avoided you know and and I mean partisanship really in the political party sense and i I, I don't mean that necessarily that you can do some uh, neutral objective work which is value free, and that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that at least we don't get trapped in the, uh, in the more pedestrian kind of um, lining up behind uh, the issues of the day along our preferred partisan preferences. And that's worth avoiding. And there's a lot of it and, and, and seems to be even growing, if I may say that. So, so it's worth, worth avoiding generally. So let me open, I guess, a slightly different political uh, take, which I think combines uh, what was being said with the earlier question on what advice you'd give or what, how you think of research. I think one thing I always tell my students that I'll give you information, but I'll never give you advice. Mm. And I think the reason I say that is, I think this may be particularly true of my field, is we have a terrible reputation for diversity. And one of the ways, I think, reasons we have a terrible reputation of diversity is that we um, take particular ways of looking at the world or particular things to do and say, this is the right way of doing it. And people move away. I mean, we have this problem from undergraduate onwards. You know, we have lots of students take Econ 101. They believe economics is going to tell about the world. And then they're like, you're not telling us anything about the things we care about. So we are going to go to many other humanity and, um, you know, arts and sciences or, you know, ethnicity, race, and migration, but we're not going to stick with economics because it's so sterile and it's so dry. And I think it's a huge loss uh, to our profession, but it's also one that perpetuates itself because then you have the people who stick in it are the ones who find it interesting. And that's good, that should be part of it, but it shouldn't be all of it. Mm. So I'm very hesitant to talk about, um, you know, 
good ways of doing research, or good ways of identifying the things that I do that have worked for me, but you know, they probably won't work for someone else. I think what's important to me is to really just constantly keep asking someone why they're interested and what they're interested in, and in that process you learn a lot, and you can maybe help them refine that question. But I'd be very hesitant to go further than that. Um, I think, you know, there's just recently the, the new president of Harvard was announced, something was very striking, was she took a very strong stance in her, whatever, two minute speech of saying, you know, we are not the ivory tower. Mm -hmm. and I, that is the past, the view of academia as an ivory tower. And I think those are some of the issues that at least in my, prof my field, I think we really need to kind of struggle with and ask is how, how much can we as, the, as people uh, practicing the profession be unrepresentative of those who we try to study? And I think this is true the world over, and certainly it's true in India. You know, for instance, there's now there's a Bahujan Society of Economists, the other groups we know we are quite elitist in how we are. And I think, I think that's the kind of politics that I think we should, address, should not shy away from. So actually, it's I mean, much that's important about how to ask a good research question or frame one has already been said. But for an experimental biologist and for a neuroscientist, I would say the one thing is replicate. Yeah. You know, what happens is that we take knowledge that is produced as, as a given. Yeah. And that may not necessarily always be true. And so the, the advice I would give to myself, to anyone who is doing an experiment that is building on prior literature is take the time to do the replication. Mm. Perhaps that's vital because you are building based on many things that you believe are rock solid, but may not always be in context, etc. So I think that coming in rather, rather than coming in with a strong view of what you want to do, be open to what you find. Yeah. And then once you find it, be sure it's real and robust and replicable. I think there is a replication crisis in experimental biology, mm -hmm. and it needs to be called out by the biology community itself and really tackled and handled, and we need to ensure that, I mean, there will be things that don't replicate across laboratories because of minor reasons, but when you have this large a field of people looking at things, it is critical that what you're seeing, you're certain about. Mm. and that it is replicable across multiple groups around the world. So a more collaborative way of looking at broad research questions so that there's a certainty with which the, the worry I would have with claiming a hypothesis or an idea or a research finding is that then it becomes so centralized to one group or a few groups that it doesn't allow for the possibility of multiple people to test it yeah. and multiple people to really confirm the veracity of it. And so I think that's vital. So I would worry less perhaps about the, um, whether the research question is absolutely correct, but whether what you found is robust. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, um, <clears throat> I guess unlike some other fields, maybe in mathematics and more so in number theory, you know, there are all these vast all encompassing conjectures kind of which people have made. So there are some people who just have a very in a bird eye view of the field and they build all these patterns which are often just conjectural and uh, I'm certainly not one of those persons. So in, in what I do is I kind of, you know, I, I try to understand it, but then I, I zoom in on some particular aspect of it which I find beautiful or which I think I can understand um, and uh, also find interesting and this is, I think, uh, maybe a useful way of doing doing mathematics. Like, you know, um, if if you can be one of those person who builds this landscape, then fantastic. But if not, then you kind of uh, try to understand it and then zoom in on and and build the smaller intricacies in it. You know, the the conjectures kind of don't often tell you how to approach it. You know, they they are sort of a big smooth landscape, but then there are lots of intricacies inside it which you have to still unravel. Mm. Yeah. So. Please. So I completely agree with Rohini that uh, that uh, that one should not be prescriptive mm. in in how one does science. I think there are different avenues, different approaches, and what works for one person does not work for or may not work for other people. So I think that for me is number one that you need mm. to find what works for you. And uh, um, so having said that, 
you know, I would go back to somebody whom I'm very fond of, of, of reading, Peter Medevar, who, you know, so he kind of said that science is the art of the soluble. Yeah. It's, it's identifying problems that can be solved, but that's not a triviality. You can always find trivial problems to solve. Mm -hmm. It's identifying important problems. Now, now of course, you know, again, as I think Vidita said, uh, that you can, post facto, you can come up with a logical way of approaching, uh, you know, of explaining why you did what you did. Hmm. That usually is not reality. You often got there via a set of random walks uh, around the place. Hmm. Now, how do you identify a problem? I, I guess the first thing for me would be to, uh, you need to be asking questions. The questions are usually not, uh, certainly the early stages of your career, they're often not deep questions, but you need to be asking questions. And you'll often ask foolish questions. You, you, need to, you need to be prepared, I think, to ask those foolish questions, because if you don't, you'll never ask interesting questions. You have to be prepared to make mistakes. So that's one. The second one, I completely agree with Suman, with you know, a, 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 a different thing, which is that you need to come in, I think, into a field without baggage, without as much baggage. Very often, you're too close to the, to the forest to see the trees. And one way I like to do this is to actually jump fields. So say, within astronomy, every few years, you just do something completely different. You know, jump into a different field and fool around over there for a while. And very often, that gives you, that helps. And I, I've seen other people doing this. One of the people in the audience is an expert at this. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that often helps because you bring in a different perspective. You bring in different tools. Mm -hmm. And those tools are often, just having a new tool in a different field often helps you make huge progress often addressing the same questions. Mm. And the third thing for me is what I would call canteen conversations, the coffee conversation, the water cooler conversations, where you're chatting science. You're not chatting detail, and you're chatting with people who are not in your specific field, at which point you cannot spend your time talking detail. You have to talk big picture. Mm. So, and the big picture are the questions that people in the field want to have answered. So very often it's useful to just go and attend. I, I mean, I used to like doing this when I was a postdoc, even now, but I, I wound up doing it much less often, unfortunately, which is kind of funny, uh, is to go to a conference in which you're not working. And don't give a talk. Just listen to what people are saying. And, and kind of, so you, you know, you obviously will not, by definition, get the details. Mm. But the fact that you don't get the details means that you have to focus on the big picture. Mm. And then you might get a feeling for what are the big picture questions in this field, what is the field moving towards? And is that something that kicks you, that makes you feel like working on it? Uh, so I don't think any of this, I would not want to remotely say that this is prescriptive. Hmm. I don't feel that this is how you know, one should do science. It might work for you, it might not. And I actually feel that there are, you know, some people are just, I mean, again, something I like of astronomy, you might just fall in love with the galaxy and say, hey, I just want to desperately understand this galaxy inside out. And that's bookkeeping. Mm. And, but maybe it works for you. Maybe that's your style. Yeah. And other people might want to jump fields and do you know, all kinds of stuff. So I would say that you know, what, if it works for you, and if the questions that you're asking are interesting you know, in, with regard to that galaxy, it's still good science. Yep. I mean, there is poetry in science. There's also a lot of bookkeeping. Mm. Again, metaphor, sorry. And I think it's, it's, it's very, on my... <laughs> no, absolutely. And I think it's very useful to remember that, that, you know, we all tick in different ways and that somehow, no matter how tenuous this knowledge is, it's still useful in a way, right? Like, and, and adds to the big picture. What that pic big picture amounts to is something we, you know, collectively find out. So, moving from here to the question and answer session. Um, so, please raise your hands and let me know and we can um, take questions for our... Yes, please, go ahead. Hi, uh, I'm Padmini and I have a question for Rohini. Um, uh, so I am also someone who works in the informal economy. I, am, uh, I work in the development sector. Um, and uh, as you mentioned, uh, it's, it's the interaction of formal and informal institutions which uh, interest you a lot. So um, as, at the current moment, I'm working on uh, skilling in the informal sector. And what we see is a lot of, um, whether it's economics or whether it's business or however we look at it, a lot of what we are uh, seeing comes from uh, the knowledge in the formal sector. 
it's uh, wanting to formalize this sector, wanting to formalize the informal economy and all of that. So um, what I want to know is how much of the collaborative research that you do with regards to uh, different organizations or NGOs and all of that, uh, informs how you approach the informal sector? In, or is it something that you're working with? Is it, uh, so for example, uh, I, I know that you're working with gender forums. So if, when you're working on gender, for example, uh, we see, uh, so for example, if we are looking at um, empowering women, if there's, there has to be a module on empowering women, it's often about laws or this or that, but you don't have these practical skills of how do you develop autonomy. And uh, part of it you answered when you spoke about uh, whether economics is contextual or whether economics is science and all of that. And, and then um, I guess my question is, um, when you're working collaboratively, when you say interdisciplinary research, how much of it are you taking back to rethink economics, uh, to rethink the discipline and say, this is how the theory needs to change to be, as you said, uh, representative of the people, I mean, given that 90% yes. of India's population is in the informal economy. The short answer is a lot, and especially as you said, if you talk about women, and you talk about women in most developing countries, but probably even in, in especially in India, we know outside, in agriculture obviously, but outside of agriculture, the majority of women who are employed are in the informal sector and are self-employed. And we also know that this number has been declining over the last two decades. And so I think you know you have you, you can't not look at the informal economy if you want to look at employment. I think you know the, the huge internal migration we saw after when the COVID lockdown happened was just a demonstration of the cost of the informal economy as well. When you have no rights, very little social security. So I think you know it's hard to work on welfare issues in India and not and not work on that. I think in terms of uh, redefining uh, economics, I guess it's more, I would say it's about broadening economics. Um, you know, it's saying, as you said, that you know, sometimes when you write down households and models, people don't think about, say, norms as constraints, right? So they, they think they talk, so it's very common to talk about how the bargaining power of a husband or a wife will matter in terms of who gets to work or where they work. But they don't actually think about the fact that you hear very often uh, when you say go to villages is that uh, even poor men would sort of feel this pressure of sanskritization and say that my community will talk down upon me if my wife goes out to work. That's a normative constraint and you know, typical models of household would not have that. So I think, I think that's happening. I think that's the good news that I think that, that those conversations are happening. Um, Indira has a question. Yes, thank you, Janvi, and thank you for walking us through all the interesting things that everyone is doing. Um, yes, uh, so my question is actually to all of you, considering that there's uh, so much you communicated to us through the discussion about how you uh, speak to different levels in your collaborations, to your students, to the public, to citizens, etc., cetera, um, and across fields. Um, how important is training of communication? You know, as a scientist and writer, for me, I feel that communicating uh, is such a critical aspect of collaboration. And so I was just curious as to how you deal with that. Um, Who would like to take that on your well, uh, I have a very short answer. I mean, um, I think we do a reasonable job of communicating within our, our community of mathematicians, but we certainly need to improve how, uh, you know, we communicate uh, what we do with other people. And I, I'm not very good at it, but I, I hope as a community we, we get better at it. Um, is there someone else who would like to? I'd just like to add to that, saying that I think it's vital and it's missing in our training. Yes. It's uh, not something that's embedded in graduate school or graduate training, and it needs to be because it is, it's a critical component of, I mean, we are taxpayer funded, and we're not communicating to the broader community why what we do is of interest and relevant. So I actually think it needs to be embedded into training as a vital key component. So, yeah. I have the same feeling exactly. Um, we've. We haven't had this as a, as a part of teaching in India, training in India. It's just started to come in recently. So for example, at, at my institute, we started this two years ago, where we have, a, we have a 
a course on research methodology and ethics where we decided, a couple of us, that, the, that this is something that we need to teach people, how to give talks, how to write papers. And you would, historically, it's been imagined that you will just learn this by osmosis. And that's not true. You really see that it doesn't really happen. Some people who've had the fortune of being, of coming from a background where you get the training, you know, quote, automatically, unquote, do better than others who are not trained. And you can train. Mm. And we have noticed this in the last two years that our students have actually, I mean, this is, a, of course, anecdotal evidence, but the quality of talks has, within the community, within the institution, has improved uh, within the last two years. Uh, of course, this is kind of, you, you, you might argue that this is uh, self-praise, so to speak, because you know, we are praising ourselves for setting up this course and then saying that our students do teach, you know, speak better. On the other hand, we're also looking at the evaluations of the seminars given by people. So I think it is foundational to, to do this, and we don't spend enough time on it. Um, so we have a question at the back there, and then here, please. Hello, uh, my name is Arun Shireen, and uh, my question is open to the panel. Uh, it's about, can you comment on the mental fortitude or characteristics th that is needed to balance yourself from doing relevant work that's out there versus disruptive work or asking tough questions wherein the chances of failure are very high? Did you want to? Vendita, we're okay, looking at you. No, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let, let, let me go first. Since, uh, uh, so I think that's a really good question. Um, I think uh, it's an important question, and I think you need to learn how to fail. That's an important part of doing science. So the way I would look at it is that you need to pick a distribution of problems that you're working on, and out of which one or two might be what I would call blue sky problems, where you expect to fail. And maybe, and, and that distribution depends on, on you. Maybe 50, 60% of your time is spent on, you know, what I would call uh, standard problems, which you, know, you will make progress on. They're good problems, but they're standard problems. But you need to spend some fraction of your time on problems on which almost by definition you will fail. Because if you don't do those, I mean, those are the ones where if you succeed, there's a huge leap. So you need to be prepared to fail, so to speak. And then you might make a leap. If you succeed in one of those, that's a big leap. But you need to also spend time on, on things which are, I think, which are um, well-defined, so to speak, in your field. And I think that's different for different people. I mean, the one thing I'd add that, so I agree with you in terms of you know, what it takes to make progress, but I think we need to think about what this means in translating it down to the training phase. So mm. I think most areas, and certainly in economics recently, we've seen a lot of surveys telling us that mental health concerns are very high, precisely because of the fact that you know, failure is not rewarded on the job market. At the same time, you know you want to not write the paper that you know how it'll turn out when you start writing it. So I think, I think that to me that's an open question is that as academic disciplines, how do we manage what we uh, think makes for good research with the fact that at the training stage it's way too high a burden to put on potentially extremely good researchers to say that you need to write that one stellar paper, but if you tried writing it and you failed many times, um, you don't have a way into the academy. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, can I add a little one point yeah, to that please, one? Please, please, I'll say that, I mean, this is something that we discuss in the lab sometimes, uh, all of us, and I, uh, you don't have to celebrate only your findings. You're never gonna run out of findings to celebrate if you can start essentially celebrating anything interesting that's out there. So, you know, journal clubs, when you read a really cool paper, it's someone else's work and you're loving it, enjoy it thoroughly. It doesn't have to just be that you have to make that discovery to thoroughly enjoy it. And if you restrict it to every time you have a win, there'll be just a few in a long career span, there'll be a few if you're lucky. Yeah. But if you can celebrate other people's interesting findings and interesting papers, you're never gonna run out of stuff to, exciting stuff to talk about. And I think that is vital early on in graduate training to start feeling that way, that you can really enjoy a great paper. You didn't necessarily make that discovery, but it's a monumental one in your field and what's stopping you from also enjoying it. I think that does help to buffer the inevitable experimental failures that people will anyway go through. You can't help it. Yep. 
Sudhir, you want so, to? I mean, one, uh, I just wanted to add along similar lines that the fortitude of asking difficult questions is one part of the story, you know, and, and I would do much like Nissan suggested, which is to, to, to ask a, a range of questions. And if you commit yourself to only the big questions, then it's going to call for a certain level of um, resilience that, I mean, tests everyone. Um, so having things that are handleable and solvable in reasonable time is a very important part of um, having a research sort of repertoire that one can work with. But Rohini's point, I, I would just reiterate that just the standard process of journal review and uh, is like a hazing ritual of some yeah. sort, right? And so you, the, even even if you're not asking the most spectacular question, you've got to have some fortitude to just go through that process and and do that over and over again. And uh, and in early stage research, that's uh, difficult. I think as even as you go along, it's it might be a little less uh, damaging, but it's not easy. Yep. Um, so I think that there's, some, there's something to that process generally that you have to take yourself a little lightly and be able to laugh at things and just move on and yourself and others sometimes. Yep, <laughs> just that too. Um, you had a question. Uh, let me go back to the first question all of you asked about your uh, self-motivation, which is very obvious and clear because of uh, the stage where you are today and have been chosen for this Infosys Prize by a prestigious jury. My question is, today you are all in the stage of mentors to your mentees. And your mentees, all of them, may not have the self-motivation like what you had when you chose your fields. So how do you manage this motivation of your mentees uh, it may be at various stages and how much, is it a challenge first of all? Hmm. Or all of them are self-motivated like what you were when you started your career? I don't think so. Is it a challenge? And if it is a challenge, what do you do and how much time and effort you need to spend? My, my um, experience is that the average student I supervise, um, even an advanced graduate student or a PhD student is far better trained and far better motivated than I ever was at their age. So I don't have this problem at all. My, um, my challenge is almost along the lines of the question that you asked, which is to pace people and you know mm. cope with some disappointments along the way and, and kind of settle expectations because their, their levels of motivation and, and ambition are just sky high. So that's not a problem. I, I would see myself as more, and more of an accidental uh, researcher. At the time that I started off, um, my, my students are much more focused and super focused. <laughs> so yeah, that's my experience. Mm. I mean, I'd agree at least. My sense is my field has also become a lot more professionalized. It's much more streamlined in what you do in terms of coursework, in terms of how the job market works. So I think that helps. The I think the trickier part for us in economics, and maybe it's true in some of the sciences as well, is a lot of students will choose to go to industry, not to academia. And um, I think students will say to themselves that it's very tricky for them to decide when to tell their mentor this. They feel if they tell them too early on, the mentor will lose interest because they're like, you're going to industry. Um, why should we give you the same level of training? Uh, you can finish your PhD, but you don't get the same level of training. And I think it's a tricky question. I find it a tricky question as an advisor is I'd like to treat all my students equally, but I know someone who's going to go to the industry is never probably going to publish their paper, their PhD thesis. I've seen that time after time again. So do I really spend all that extra time that really takes to something publishable when I know that they're not taking that track. And that's not to say that's a right or wrong decision on their part, that's what they want to do, but I think it does raise tricky questions and how do you manage that? And I don't think I've learned the answer to that yet, so if others have it, I'd love to hear it. Did you have something to say? Yeah, uh, I can add something. Uh, so what I see is that uh, every student is motivated, but motivation of you know what they want to do is very different. I mean, uh, everybody will not be motivated to do exactly what I am motivated to do. So what I say is that instead of you know taking it as different, I have you know started respecting their motivation. Mm -hmm. For example, some student is having a motivation of say doing a you know great thing in finance, although he's studying mechanical engineering. Mm -hmm. And if I respect that, 
maybe i can find something you know in the core of the you know mathematical foundation which has also a linkage with foundation and a linkage to what i am doing mm. so instead of you know trying to drive the students exactly what i am motivated to do i try to see what is their passion and maybe try to make me flexible to respect that and then take bring something out of it mm. and it is a lot of work yeah yeah it's, it, 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 it's very tough yeah did um, yeah yeah i think that's a good question and uh, I think what Rooney and you know, so he said was is right that there's it's much there's much more structure now, it's much more professional, but that does not necessarily imply a higher motivation. In fact, I would almost argue the converse. Um, my impression, at least you know, again anecdotally, is that the diversity in motivation is wider today than it was when I was a student, and uh, I worry about this. Certainly, I've seen this with, with my own students, and I worry that I'm not good, doing a good enough job to kind of. you know there are people who are not going to be finishing who who are not going to stay in research they don't want to stay in research after the phd you worry about the fact that you're not uh, uh, that you shouldn't then treat them differently from a student who is super excited and uh, and wind up you should not spend more time with a student who is super excited you should make sure you give enough time to a student who just wants to finish a phd so that at least the process of doing the phd is a happy one for the student so i think that's an important question it's i mean that bothers me i don't have a solution for it and i don't think it is possible to have a solution for it because the reality is that it will depend on the individuals i mean a phd is difficult it's it's a relationship in some sense between you know between two people and i don't think you can have a one size fits all solution for this it depends on your style it depends on the student style and every student every guide will have a different style so you need to find a kind of a you know a path that works for both of you and it's it it can be difficult yeah so as the evening sort of draws to a close i will request the last two um um members of our audience to ask their questions and we take those questions and then slowly okay call it a day so uh, i'm uh, veeran shetty i represent industry engaged in uh, developing technology uh, research and technology for commercialization purpose so my question is with respect to the collaboration between academic institutions that is the research community as well as the industry so there is a perception in the industry that the 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 researchers community not specifically you are you know very well your deep research is not doing a uh, right research to take into commercialization whereas the research communities also have the accusation saying that you know the industries are not coming forward to work together to make it useful for the community and the end user do you see this as a challenge and what is your prescription to improve this and strengthen this and make india much better to use the local grown uh, research to the betterment of world thank you thank you and if i may hi i am elizabeth i have two questions one for professor mahesh and one for professor vaidya um i guess probably the two disciplines i feel most illiterate about so i think the world can be divided into people who love mathematics and hate mathematics as is not true for any other discipline probably i think the other uh, sciences probably have addressed that by doing a lot of popular science writing for instance you know like mm. in the case of the roger penrose kind of book in physics or the bill bryson in astronomy sort of opens the world of these disciplines for people who don't have any specific training in that i was wondering if it's uh, has mathematics attempted that kind of popular writing uh, and you know i sort of w- wonder about this because uh, i am a mother of a five year old and i'm already wondering whether will she will go to uh, the stage where she says i don't want to do mathematics whereas it's such a probably fascinating field are we doing something really wrong in our school systems and get this popular mathematics writing somehow plug that hole uh that's my first question the second to professor vaidya i was recently reading about your uh, uh work uh the general conversations are uh, in the field of mental health usually are at the subjective level at least in the urban areas that is if you feel you're depressed yeah you must be uh, and uh, the solutions to it also are mostly at the subjective level that you identify that you're depressed and then you talk about it and you can solve it through this talking and so on i was wondering whether your research sort of moves it away from this 
uh, entirely subjective field to say that it's also possible to map, I don't know, levels of depression and bring the conversation. Because sometimes I worry that, you know, to take it back to Foucault's notion of incitement of dif uh, discourse, that we are also in an age where there's an incitement to mental health uh, discourse. So whether your research sort of brings a balance to that incitement to discourse. Thank you. So if I may request, uh, since the last two questions were very specific to the two of you, uh, to take them and then we take the industry question across the table. Uh, okay, maybe I'll, I'll sort of, you know, uh, take this question because I don't have much to say. And uh, this is the question a mathematician dreads on a forum like this. <laughs> always, anyway. uh, so, uh, you know, I've always loved mathematics, so it's kind of hard for me to understand the other side. Uh, so that's one, uh, one point of view. Uh, but there are, you know, there, there are sort of many people who write mathematics very well, in my opinion, like maybe one of the most famous one is Martin Gardner, who kind of uh, writes popular maths books, and even sort of other, there are many other. Uh, it's, it's, it's the abstract nature, I think, that kind of scares people. You, if, you're, if you're reading something in, even in theoretical physics, you know, like, because you can, you can sort of visualize whatever physical objects that there are, you know, if you're in astronomy or something, then uh, I, you, you think, okay, because I, I know, you know, I've seen pictures of galaxy, I understand it or something, you know, but uh, w w the, the, the hard science that goes behind it, one can ignore as a, when you're reading in popular science. Whereas in mathematics, both the objects as well as sort of how you reach there is, is both abstract. And so maybe it requires a lot more kind of patience or training to, to get there, you know, to understand or, or visualize those things. And maybe that is what uh, uh, scares people away, I think. <laughs> so I should start first by caveating that I study rats and mice, and you can't <laughs> model, um, you know, human depression, and in fact, the full spectrum and range of human emotions in rodent models at all. So that's the first caveat with I, which I should start. What you can do is there are signatures of behaviors that are common across mammals, and you can study them. Um, Depression is, is diagnosed based on criteria that are used in a diagnostic and statistical manual. And I think in India, we still have um, a real inability to talk about mental health disorders. We are far away from a point where there is an ease of conversation with mental health disorders. It's really, you know, it's a buried problem in large part. I think that the, the spectrum of society that talks about it easily is relatively elite with access to um, available tools. I mean, uh, the, the burden of mental health in this country is huge and unidentified. And I don't think yet we have a handle where we could categorically say the scale of depression. There are scaling ranges that are used clinically, but it's a very complex syndromal illness. It's already difficult enough to sort of break it down to in its nuts and bolts in an animal model, which is by itself already defective. So this, these are the challenges of disorders of this nature. And in the Indian context, we are far away from a situation where we've even begun to grapple with saying, what is the scale of mental health burden in the country? And when you think about a period of time like we are coming out of now, especially we were talking about this a little earlier, coming out of COVID, the scale will have only amplified. And so I think, uh, you know, I think it's, it's, a, it's a discussion that needs to be had much more, mm -hmm. much more openly and much more with an acknowledgement of the fact that we have a, a real hidden burden of, of disease in the country. So the industry question now. Who would yeah, I can I can address. Go ahead, please. Yeah, I mean, uh, maybe uh, because I'm from engineering, it is more connected with industry than many others. So what I can say is that, you know, there are many ways in which we can look into this. You know, first of all, this is a very valid uh, observation. Now, in academics, uh, I would say the, the hindrance is that it is not incentivized. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if I'm an assistant professor and I'm going for my next, you know, promotion as associate professor, people will still count number of papers and this and that and not much on what I have done really for, you know, solving a real industrial problem. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, you know, that aspect of your 
career path being assessed, being connected with industry in a, in a specific sense, but broadly with applications mm. in these kinds of areas. I'm not talking about very you know, abstract uh, science, but at least in these applications. That has to be inbuilt in, the, I would say, your career development pathway. If it is not there, it will not naturally come. It will naturally come to only a few mm. because you know, they are intrinsically good at it. They have good outreach, but it will not gel. And the other possibility is that, you know, again, like forcefully create programs where you have jointly mentored, say, you know, project students or PhD students, one mentor from the industry and one mentor from the academia. So in that way, the academia person also, you know, learns the real industrial issues mm. when solving a problem. And industry person also uh, gets that, you know, very hot research outcome that has, Im that has just come out and applied for industrial you know, work. So that kind of, you know, forceful environment mm. has to be created by certain, you know, policies or, mm. you know, otherwise people who are naturally driven to this kind of outreach will do, but others will stay away from that. This is what is my impression. So the reward system is geared towards a certain yeah. kind of output outcomes, etc. Did, does anyone want to I'd like add? to add a little yeah. bit to that because I've actually collaborated quite consistently with industry. Both when I was a graduate student, I watched it. It was certainly part of the ecosystem. When I came back and set up my lab in India, I was hopeful to do it much more. It's been relatively limited on the scale of what one would have liked to see hasn't happened and I don't know where the blocks are for an ease of dialogue. Yeah. Um, I actually think that there are missing pockets in that pipeline, this is what causes some of the challenge. You have yeah. very fundamental research or basic research. You don't have a pipeline of translation. You don't have the entire pipeline. And to, to kind of take two ends of it and get them to talk to each other without anything in between yeah. makes it truly challenging. Yeah. And I think we are not using it as a, um, I agree that we don't use it as a outcome of our universities and our institutions, it's not yet a measured outcome. When it isn't a measured outcome, there isn't, as a consequence, some degree of, of requirement. You don't want it to be artificially Im imposed yeah. because not all research is automatically going to have an application. And sometimes things you thought would have an application have none and you find application in an utterly unexpected. But, but certainly to have more openness to that dialogue would be nice to see. Maybe I could add something. So in radio astronomy, we have fairly tight collaborations with industry. Mm -hmm. But the collaborations are of, a, in, in astronomy, I would say, but especially radio astronomy, you know, because we build telescopes. And so a lot of the actual building uh, is done by industry. That's one part of it, including the design, for example, of the dishes. Normally, that's done in collaboration with faculty members at the institute and engineers, senior engineers at the institute. And pretty much everything, you know, the, the telescopes that have been designed and built have been done in collaboration. Similar things are happening, for example, for this International Square Kilometer Array project, where there's a lot of work happening in India for software for this telescope. So at, at the Institute, we collaborate with places like TCS, for example, for software for us, and also for software for the telescope. ThoughtWorks is another, another company heavily involved. In the case of the 30-meter telescope, an optical telescope, uh, there's uh, uh, one reason that we've gotten involved in it heavily in India is, is the glass industry in India. Hmm. But all of these, so, so this is, I would say, an example of collaboration. But one thing which is lacking, I would say, over here is the research aspect of the collaboration. This is more the implementation of the collaboration. So you, you, you've done something, and now this uh, is implemented by the industry as opposed to a research collaboration. We have a few of those in things like designing receivers for the telescopes, where there are companies which are set up to design receivers, and we collaborate with them. But they, they, they are much more rare. And so I agree with that there's some kind of a hole in between. The, 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 the research aspect is not as important in these collaborations as the implementation, as, as the development aspect. Mm. I think that is an important um, aspect to note, so the missing sort of institutional, procedural links that might actually connect for this to become possible. Mm -hmm. And also that it is to be seen as a collaboration, right? Like yeah. where it, it um, I mean, in the United States, for example, we see a lot of contractual work mm -hmm. um, where both the state as well as industry come in and say, 
um, here are a few of our people, here are a few of your people, and then you know, we, we might we work together, kind of. So when we started this evening, um, and you know, we were getting mic'd up and discussing you know, uh, uh, between ourselves how it is that we would like the evening to unfold, um, the setting looked like sort of a, um, an anatomy um, theater Mm -hmm. Turn inside out, right? Like because normally you'd watch an anatom anatomical, theatrical sort of you know doing at some point in history uh, from upside down, and you know in which case we would have been um, you know in a well as opposed to where we are. So another thought that came to our mind is that this is more like a seance with a with a mesmerized audience around us looking at you know who we get in touch with and what what we talk about. And in effect, we were of course talking. Um, about what we do and why we do it and uh, what that might matter, um, uh, why that might matter. For some of you in this room, I think this would be, uh, uh, the questions as well as the answers would simply reflect what you've already been doing for a long time. We have, you know, many of you are very senior in your fields. Uh, for, uh, and, and, you know, uh, I hope what was interesting then in the conversation for you was to see um, that, you know, across the human, the social, and the natural sciences. There are some um, behaviors, ideas, but also uh, concerns that rise, you know, that, that speak to each other. And for those of you who, you know, who are starting out in your careers, and as either students or early career um, researchers, I hope you're taking back um, some of the everydayness of what it is that a good research amounts to, and so feel sort of, you know, less. Um, less of a less of an inhibition about approaching it and wanting to wanting to engage with it, um, with the enthusiasm and the energy that today's panelists brought <laughs> to the discussion. So it has been a wonderful evening. Um, true to academic conversations, this has run over time. Um, it has also not gone to plan. Uh, there are some questions still remaining on the table, which I hope to you know uh, bring to you in the coming days, if not already at, at um, you know the. Uh, evening today. Um, thank you everyone for, you know, uh, watching us uh, and then engaging with us, uh, trying to tease out um, our ideas, um, our, uh, again, concerns, but also what it is that brings us together and why research might, at the end of the day, matter to all of us. So thank you. <laughs>